and welcome to the EcoCast by Actual Tech Media. Our topic today, storage evolution, exploring modern storage solutions. Thank you so much for joining us for this exciting EcoCast. Today we will hear from Pure Storage, Commvault, and Cloudy and McCaston, who are here to help us explore what's changing, what's trending, and what you need to know about modern storage solutions. My name is Jess Steinbach with Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special event, along with David Davis, who will be joining us shortly. Before we get into our session here today, there are a few things that you should know about this EcoCast. Of course, we do have some awesome prizes lined up for you, and I will get back to those in a bit more detail in just a moment. But first, I want to draw your attention to the question box in your webinar control panel. If you haven't already said hi, we would love to see people connecting across the world. So drop a greeting and give a wave to your friends in the actual tech media community. We also want this to be an informative event for you, which means we want those technical questions. So throughout today's EcoCast, we hope that you'll get engaged and make sure to ask all of the burning storage solution questions that you might have. Not only will we have team members responding to you during the live event, but we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of each presentation. If we do not get to your question during the live event, don't worry. The awesome humans from Pure Storage, Commvault, Cloudian, and Casting will be following up afterwards. And of course, good things should always be shared. So when you hear something interesting or exciting in today's EcoCast, get social and share that with your friends. You can actually use the Twitter button right there in your audience console, uh, and the hashtag for today's event will be automatically added to your post. While you are exploring that audience console, make sure to check out the handouts tab where you will find some fantastic resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. There are learning portals, white papers, solution briefs, and more. So be sure to click around in there and do a little bit of exploring. As always, we have some great prizes collected here for you. On today's EcoCast, we will be giving away three $500 Amazon gift cards. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for that prize and meet all of the actual Tech Media Prize terms and conditions, which you can find in that handy dandy handouts tab. So again, just click into the handouts section of your audience console and scroll down. As we mentioned earlier, we love hearing all of your questions during these live events. So to spark all of your, your curious folks out there, we have a special additional prize for you. In today's EcoCast, we will be giving away a $50 Amazon gift card to the best question asked in each of our live sessions. The teams will review all the questions asked after the event, which means even if your question does not get asked live, there is still a chance to win. We will follow up with all the winners after the event. And again, if you have any questions about whether or not you are eligible for any of these prizes, just check out those terms and conditions in the handout section. A few quick reminders for you here including the fact that all grand prize winners are required to submit an IRS form W-9 to actual tech media. And if you are a winner here today, you always have the option to donate the value of that prize to one of our selected charities. Thanks to the generous prize winners on previous actual tech media events, thousands of dollars have been donated to these wonderful charities. So if you are a winner today and you would like to get involved with one of these amazing organizations, let us know because we would absolutely love to help make that happen. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us today and we want to keep that good feeling going. So please be sure to use that Twitter button that we chatted about earlier, which will add the hashtag for today's event and help you share all the exciting things that you're learning. And make sure to connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and Facebook. We want to hear from you. Also, we encourage you to follow Actual Tech Media on LinkedIn and YouTube for more great content after this event. And speaking of exciting content, if you haven't already checked out the Actual Tech Media Gorilla Guide Book Club, now is the time. The Gorilla Guide Book Club gives you access to free enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts, so you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books will work on your Kindle or mobile device, and they are all completely free. You can download these awesome resources at GorillaGuide.com, and there's a link in the handouts tab for you as well. Well, we think you're great, and we think you probably have great friends too. So another way to win this prize, uh, prize today is to refer an industry friend or coworker to the Actual Tech Media event series. 
Now, you'll find the link to do that right in your handouts tab, and you will be automatically redirected at the end of the event as well. And we want to promise you that we are not going to spam your friends and coworkers. I know that's always a risk. We will send them an invitation to a list of upcoming events, and if they don't respond, we will send them one little reminder from us, and that's it. Then both you and your coworker could win a $300 Amazon gift card. We hold those drawings every month, and don't worry, we don't make you split the gift card with your friend. <laughs> All right, so we have a lot of fantastic content to dig into today in this EcoCast, and I think it's time to get started. I'm going to hand the mic over to our keynote speaker, Actual Tech Media's David Davis, who is here to chat with us about the evolution of modern storage solutions. Over to you, David. Thanks so much, Jess. Really great presentation there. Great way to kick off the event. Uh, it's time now to just do a little bit of you know, stage setting to uh, talk about the challenges and solutions that uh, modern storage uh, managers and IT organizations are facing out there today. And I mean, we've got some awesome uh, expert presentations lined up for you today. And so the idea here with my short keynote is really just to kind of set the stage for that. And I'm going to do that first off by just talking about the challenges that I believe that most companies are facing out there today uh, in the world of technology. Um, but my challenges, I'm sure, aren't all-encompassing. Uh, and that's why we're going to have a poll right after my short presentation here where I want to hear what your challenges are. So in my opinion, uh, the challenges that companies are facing out there today are you know, first off, just a massively growing data set. I mean, I'm constantly out of space on my, my laptop and desktop and iPhone and iPad. And if I'm sure those of you out there in the audience are as well, always looking for more and more storage capacity. Well, in the, in the world of the data center and in cloud you know, storage, uh, your company's data is, is growing at the same you know, exponential rate, but you have it compounded by the number of end users you have and the number of applications you have and the type of data you know, that you're storing. Could be videos, could be imaging uh, data, things that consume just tons of space. And I know many companies out there that I talk to, uh, this is one of their greatest challenges is just the uh, petabyte data sets that continue to increase and increase you know, at this exponential rate. And then you have cloud native applications you know, to deal with, uh, new app, which are fantastic I, and which I love, but your storage also needs to accommodate for these new types of applications. You have containerized applications uh, that in many cases are orchestrated by Kubernetes and they really need uh, container storage interfaces and they need storage that accommodates these newer types of applications. Many of you are faced with aging storage so solutions, aging SAN and NAS arrays out there uh, that really just need to be replaced. And they're just not uh, designed for today's uh, scalability and performance and availability and applications. Uh, you also have, of course, data security concerns. We need to protect our data. Uh, that's what keeps many of us up at night, I know, are you know, malicious data breaches of some kind where data could be exfiltrated out of the company and shared you know, hopefully not, but share it out on the public network, out on the internet. So we need to protect our data and we need storage solutions that can help to make this easier. We also have continuous uptime expectations, you know, from our executives and our end users. They say, well, you know, if Gmail's up 24 by seven by 365, then by golly, my company application should be up as well. And, you know, for many of us, it's especially in, you know, medium and smaller size organizations, that's a really high bar a really high expectation to set. And then we also have, of course, I'll say as the R word, ransomware uh, challenges and concerns. You know, I saw a 157-year-old uh, university just this week that was uh, shutting down permanently. And their reason that they gave, it was a university in Illinois, um, one of the primary reasons was ransomware. They had a massive ransomware infection I can share the article uh, link for you there in the questions box if you want to read more about it. They said between COVID and between their huge ransomware infection, uh, they just couldn't continue any longer. So it was really a sad story, and ransomware, unfortunately, was a part of it. And so the challenge uh, or the solution that you need for ransomware when it comes to storage, of course, is rapid recovery. If you know, that's your last line of defense, you need to get that data 
recovered as quickly as possible. So what are the solutions to these challenges? Well, you know, thankfully we have new storage solutions with massive scalability and just incredible performance thanks to flash storage, thanks to NVMe, uh, and these are going to give us greater and greater uh, performance characteristics and also capacity sizes at more affordable uh, budgets to replace those legacy storage arrays and to deal with these increasing data sets and these demands for greater performance. They also have more and more cloud data services, whether it's around uh, security or data protection or disaster recovery. We have hyperconvergent solutions that you'll learn about, you know, that uh, really eliminate those legacy storage arrays and move the storage into the compute to distribute that storage across the data center and across the cloud uh, that can help us to deal with some of these concerns. And of course, rapid recovery solutions. And we're going to learn about some really cool rapid recovery solutions on the Ecocast today that provide orchestrated DR, you know, push button DR to recover our applications and our data up in the cloud. And then finally, cloud native storage solutions, solutions that have uh, the built in uh, capacity to recognize and work with these newer cloud native applications. So we've got some awesome solutions today on the Ecocast from Pure Storage, Cloudian with Casten, and Commvault. Uh, I hope that's a great way to set the stage for today's Ecocast. Uh, Jess, I'm going to now hand it back to you to kick off our poll. We want to hear from you. What are your storage challenges? Well, thanks for that intro, David. What a great way to kick off this awesome Ecocast. As David mentioned, we have that poll question up for you. And I love these because it's such a great way for us to kind of get to know what's going on for all of you out there. Um, so if you could take a look and, uh, and answer that poll question for us, we want to know what are the biggest storage challenges that you are facing today. So when we look at these options, scalability, performance, data protection and disaster recovery, protection of cloud native applications, data security, or if there's anything else that you're not seeing on that list that you think should be highlighted, that your greatest challenge, your greatest storage challenge right now, please do put that in the question bar. We do want to hear that from you. All right, I'm just waiting to see if we get a few more results in here. Keep in mind that this is a multi-select question, so feel free to select more than one challenge. <laughs> I know we would probably all love to say that there is only one challenge facing us, but let's be honest, there are probably several. So pick your top one, two, maybe hopefully there's not three, uh, and get those selected there. Okay, so looks like we've got some great results coming in. Let's take a look at those together now. I'll give you a last second, last second. If you haven't entered, enter it in now. Okay, we're going. All right, so greatest storage challenges. Looks like our top one is data security. And then we're also hitting a little bit in that data protection, disaster recovery, and kind of a two-way tie there between scalability and performance in, in third place. So that's pretty interesting to see. Hopefully we're going to get into a, a few things today that will help you with some of these challenges as well. Um, so thanks to everyone who took the time to, to answer that. Uh, we do have one more question that we want to ask you. We're, we're really curious what your time frame is for adding new or updating existing storage data protection solutions at your company. So obviously there's a lot involved anytime you're making changes, you have to do some research and implementation and training and all the, all the fun things with change management. Um, but what, what is that ideal time frame that you're looking for? Um, so think about that zero to six months, six to 12 months, 12 to 24, or hey, if you're not sure if that's fine, that's, <laughs> that's a, uh, let's see. Just waiting to see if we can get a few more answers here. All right. Well, it looks like we're getting some good results. I'm going to give you a few more seconds. Every time I start to click away, the numbers tick up. Way to go, guys. Keep it coming. Keep answering. You're all awesome. Okay, great. So it's looking to me like there's the vast majority of the answers I'm seeing coming in are in the not sure category. So that's, that's pretty exciting because I think we can dig into that a little bit and some of the answers you might get today might help you actually uh, narrow in on that, that timeline. 
Um, also, I think the next, the next highest that we're seeing is that 12 to 24 months. So that's also great because that means a lot of the people here today are thinking a little bit longer term. So a little bit less of um, that urgent fire situation, a little bit more kind of planning ahead, which is awesome. That always gives you time uh, to do a little bit of thinking and planning. For those of you who are in the zero to six month phase, I'm not maligning that either. There's something to be said for moving quickly and taking action. Uh, all right, well, we will move forward on this now because we have a ton of stuff to get to today. And honestly, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our first two presenters in today's EcoCast, Kevin Rickson, Senior Product Marketing Manager, and Errol Hayward, Senior Marketing Solutions Man Manager at Pure Storage. Kevin and Errol, thank you for joining us. I know our audience is pumped and ready to get started on this EcoCast, so I will hand things over to you. Thank you, Actual Tech Media. We really appreciate you having us on today. So my name is Errol Hayward. I'm a Senior Portfolio Marketing Manager for Peers of Service. And I'm here with Kevin Rickson, who is Director of Portfolio Marketing for Evergreen and Services. And we're both uh, working for Pure Storage. So we're gonna give you a, a little overview of Evergreen and Peers of Service, and then walk through how we can help facilitate your journey to the different subscription services from Pure Storage. And so Kevin's gonna start with that journey by discussing Evergreen, and then I'm gonna come back and tell you a little bit about Pure as a Service. And we'll end it by addressing some of the questions that come in if time permits. So with that, Kevin, how about if you tell us about Evergreen? Great, thanks so much, Errol. And thanks everyone for being here. So what we're gonna talk about here basically is IT agility and the fact that storage has always been the roadblock to agility for IT. I mean, we've solved it with compute. We just, you know, add more nodes. Uh, we've got virtualization, networking, same thing. You rarely have to take the whole network down just to add, you know, a little more bandwidth. But with storage, you know, why is it that it seems so difficult to make sure that you could deliver the kind of uh, you know, data and, and throughput and quantity and speeds and everything else that all your users are demanding. And part of that, I think, is really driven by what people have just gotten used to with the storage market. And frankly, it's, it's driven by what we call the legacy storage vendors, you know, those, those folks that have been around 20, 30 years, um, you know, they, they, they keep coming out with incrementally better things, but it always winds up being some sort of compromise because, you know, everything started on disk and tape and whatever. And slowly they started realizing that flash was important. We realized that right from the beginning here at Pure, but, you know, it's also the business models that are um, forced on customers that make IT uh, less agile than they could be around storage. Uh, first of that is maintenance. You think about when you run out of your initial storage contract, your support contract on your storage, uh, generally the rates just start skyrocketing up and up and up. And part of the reason for that is those vendors are trying to get you to buy their new system because they don't have upgradable architecture that allows you to expand and grow and, and, and just keep it pushing, um, you know, you have to do what's called a forklift upgrade. Get rid of all the old stuff and buy brand new stuff. And this is just a huge waste of resources and time, you know, and, and, and uh, all sorts of things that could be used to work on innovation and make sure that you are delivering the best you can for your organization. And that's really what Pure was founded to do. Yes, we were founded on Flash in the sense that that was the state of the art when we you know, were founded 12 years ago. But more importantly, we sought out to simplify storage, to uncomplicate it. The idea with um, the Pure architecture and especially the business models that we deliver, you know, in the case of Evergreen, we're solving for that storage purchase that we were just talking about. So you can now purchase your storage once and deploy it once and upgrade it in place for 10 plus years. And that 10 plus years is not an idle boast. This isn't, you know, hey, we think maybe it might. We have customers who purchased Pure's very first product 10 years ago, and those arrays are still in service today. Why? Because, you know, it's not that they're running stuff that should be consigned to a museum it's because these customers were able to upgrade their storage over time across eight different hardware generations across 
25 plus major software releases without ever having to take anything offline without having to do any data migrations, you know, and then from the evergreen subscription side of things, it includes either the on uh, the um, included uh, controller upgrades, or there are on demand trade ins that are available at any time so that you can move up to the next more powerful unit of the latest generation. And there's no limit to how many times you can do that. Also on the software side, it's very much like software as a service. All the data services, the tools that run on the array that help you manage it, et cetera, those are all included in a software subscription. So as we add new features, you know everything just keeps getting better. And again, what that delivers to you is the ability to respond to business change. You know, think of all the unforeseen circumstances that can happen, um, a merger, acquisition, you know, a brand new workload that you hadn't planned on. Or let's think about the last couple of years, you know, how many organizations had to suddenly pivot to doing all their business online? Well, you know, a lot of IT shops were caught short with their storage, but not pure customers. Not only were they able to adapt and grow, but they were able to do it with predictable costs. And what that winds up doing is providing a storage purchase that starts feeling more like storage as a service. So what's in the Evergreen subscription, what we call our subscription to innovation? First of all, it starts with the data services I was just talking about. So I mentioned that as new features come out, um, they are added just like you'd be used to with software as a service. And a really good example of that is what we call our active cluster synchronous replication feature. Most other vendors, if they have it at all, charge extra for something like that. Um, whereas with Pure, we delivered it to anyone who had their ongoing Evergreen subscription. And as proof of the fact that that works, fully one third of the arrays that are running that active cluster feature today, they were purchased before we even released it as a feature, you know, and um, just constantly being able to make that, um, you know, that experience much better. Always modern infrastructure. This is the hardware subscription. That means those included controller upgrades at regular intervals, usually every three years, uh, on demand uh, controller upgrades at any time. You can trade in old flash for new, so you can take advantage of new flash technology and you know a higher density. And everything within the system is completely covered, uh, no matter the age of it. And then a world-class customer experience, a combination of guarantees, world-class support, and this idea of you know never having that um, maintenance or sub in this case subscription, you know, uh, costing more and more every year. In fact, it's a it's a flat subscription renewal. So that's what Evergreen looks like in a nutshell. And the idea here is that, you know, it starts with that architecture that I was talking about where you can deploy the storage once and then just keep upgrading it in place, not having to do the data migrations, not have to do those forklift upgrades. And if you're looking to purchase your storage, then Evergreen is the right model for you because you buy it, you manage it, it's yours but the evergreen subscription makes sure that you can keep it modern over time but you know in that sort of cloud economy we also have what's called pure as a service and i am going to uh, hand off now to errol who's going to tell you more about how you can experience the ultimate in a subscription based uh, storage experience with our pure as a service take it away errol thank you very much kevin so pure as a service is a fully functional enterprise grade storage subscription service where you know customers can consume block file uh, and object storage services and those services can be consumed on-prem um, or in an edge or, or, or hosted location like Equinix or, or Rackspace um, and if you have agreements with a service provider or, or, or GSIs then peers of service can be consumed from their hosting locations and then also um, consumed in a public cloud via AWS or Azure. And that's with our product pure cloud block store, which I will discuss a little bit later. 
So you get all the functional storage services that the peer offers supported by SLAs and commitments. And, and this includes you know, the storage, it includes the uh, data protection, seamless mobility, and this is all delivered via a, a unified subscription. Now, Peers of Service is designed around three pillars. Uh, the first one is the cloud customer experience, which means that you know we want to be able to deliver an agreed upon level of services and unlimited access to those services you know when and where it, they're, they're needed you know to, to give you an experience similar to what you would get uh, from a from a hyperscaler number two would be cloud economics so peers of service gives you choices you know gives you financial flexibility allows you to to optimize your your uh, your costs with, with flexible uh, payment models and and the budget that you would usually have to use to fund things like upgrades and refreshes you know that's no longer required because you're simply paying for a service and then number three would be cloud operations so we offer a high degree of API-driven automation, including having complete visibility and control into the uh, storage estate, you know, real-time decision-making and, and automated policy-driven decision-making around workload placement and management. And, and, you know, those are the underlying principles behind peers of service. And those services are, are based on delivering business outcomes of, of capacity, uh, availability, and, and uh, uh, performance um, um, uh, guarantees. So peers of service is all about allowing you to lower your business risk because you offload the risk um, to us, the vendor, um, and, and you can hold us accountable for the day-to-day uh, -day storage management tasks that you would typically have to do yourself. And, and part of that risk mitigation is the fact that peers of service is underpinned by evergreen architecture because you know we make the changes non-disruptively to the deployed um, uh, uh, solution. And, and so the underlying storage architecture adapts to your needs. So in, in a perfect world example, right? So, so let's say the, uh, the amount of data in your platform has, uh, has not changed. And, and for some reason, the performance starts to erode in the controllers of, of the arrays that, that we deployed. Then it will be up to us to upgrade those controllers and, and not necessarily on any set schedule, but whenever it's needed. All right, so this is the peers of service uh, catalog, um, and it's made up of six tiers of service. You know, four tiers dedicated to block services, and two tiers dedicated to um, UFFO services. Um, and, and 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 we can achieve those service levels. Um, you know, using various combinations of 52 and, and, and uh, 17 TIB blades. And for, for block services, and they're generally underpinned by flash arrays, and, and, um, but specifically for block capacity, that, that is usually underpinned by flash array C. Um, and then in the UFFO services, the, those tiers are typically underpinned by flash blade. Now in uh, the block services, you know, our, our uh, performance tier, is the most um, applicable to uh, typical customer workloads. It's also the tier that CBS or, or Cloud Block Store is automatically bundled with and, and most closely aligned with as well. The performance data and, and other information in this service catalog are a guide. And, and those of you that are working with more complex requirements will wanna consult with a peer representative. So peers of service is a highly flexible hybrid cloud and, and, and public cloud enabled. So if we build out a scenario that explains how peers of service works operationally and commercially, you can start with, with peers of service on premises, you know, in your data center, and let's place say two X70 arrays into the data center. And with peers of service, that would be considered just one site. So let's assume um, they're, they're active cluster paired arrays. And let's say there is a hundred TIB of, of committed usage on site. And, and that can be replicated in um, either asynchronous or, or synchronous mode to instances of, of CBS on the public cloud um, in either AWS or, or Azure. So a quick note on CBS or, or pure cloud block store. I mean, these are um, virtualized flash arrays in the public cloud and they're constructed based on underlying infrastructure and services from the hyperscaler. And they form an, an instance running exactly the same purity operating system as our arrays do uh, in the data center. So, so they have you know, all the same functionality, 
um, features uh, are, are, are the same uh, in, 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 uh, in the same API stack as well. So, so they can be treated like a, uh, a distributed fleet of arrays. So now back to this. So, so, so if, 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 uh, if you were to move your data from on-prem um, to the public cloud, as opposed to replicating that data, the amount of, of data doesn't change but where it's hosted does. And so we don't charge for two sets of data. Um, so so you, you can seamlessly move your data from on-prem to the cloud and back again, and there's no extra charge for that. In fact, you know, if you divide that 100 TIB um, of, of total data between on-prem and also uh, the public cloud location, and if the size of the data doesn't change, then you're paying the same amount. So you can have 50 TIB in the cloud, 50 TIB on-prem, and it's the same cost uh, with any combination of data placed on-prem or, or in the cloud. You can move the full 100 TIB to the cloud, same cost, you can move it all back to on-prem, same cost. You know, so once customers realize how uh, this model works, it becomes quite a great, a great benefit for them. Now it's the same for the hosted location here as well. If there are 100 TIB of data there, um, it can also be moved back and forth to the cloud, and you won't, and it, you'll be charged the same amount uh, for that data as well. So, so regardless of whether you place your data on prem or in the cloud, you get a single unified subscription and a single customer experience across all of those environments. All right, so. If you're trying to decide whether to uh, go with traditional storage or if you want to uh, go with the pure as a service subscription, you know, um, you can walk through a series of questions that might help you to decide. Um, for example, uh, if you use this little little uh, chart that we put together here, um, if you value um, the ability to move data between sites, including up to the cloud and back again, and only be charged for the amount of data that you have at, at any one time, uh, you you get that value uh, from from peer to service, so then peer to service might be the way to go for you. But we know that not all customers want or 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 need uh, to go that direction. So now, if you want to hold the vendor, in this case, pure, um, you know, accountable for the capacity, the availability, the performance, and and you want to ensure that there are are resources on hand to to manage your your deployed infrastructure to make sure it's always up to date um, to make sure that, you know, when new features come available, that, that they can be added at no additional charge, then probably peers of service again is, is the way to go. And then finally, if you wanna make sure that your vendor can non-disruptively uh, evolve the, you know, the store solution in line with your, your storage usage and, and needs over time, then again, you might wanna consider peers of service. So we really run up against the clock here. So unfortunately, we won't have time to answer any of the questions that you submitted live, but we will address your questions as soon as possible. So on behalf of myself and Kevin Rickson, I wanna say thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And if you want more information on Evergreen or Pure the Service or on making your storage more agile, just use the bit.ly link here uh, at the bottom of this page here to continue your journey. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. Okay, well, thank you to Kevin and Errol for that awesome presentation. Uh, we actually do have a lot of, of great questions coming in already, which is really exciting. And I just got a message from Errol that, that he actually is gonna be able to stick around a little bit longer. So he will be responding to some of those questions via chat. Uh, so do keep them coming. And while you're getting those questions in, you can see that I have put up a poll question for you. We would love to get your feedback on any additional resources that you would like to explore from Pure Storage. So make sure to check out that poll and share your thoughts with us. I also want to remind you all about the handouts tab in your audience console. There is a link there for Pure Storage that will take you to an awesome interactive tutorial. There are videos, PDFs, all kinds of great resources in that learning portal. Uh, so really do uh, be sure to check that out if you would like some more information from Pure Storage. I want to thank everyone who's answered the poll question already. We do have some great feedback coming in, and we do very much appreciate that. I'm actually just going to leave it there another minute because it is already time for our very first prize drawing. Are you excited? I'm excited. Okay. So let's do this. Our very first 
winner of a $500 Amazon gift card today is Tony Dominguez from California. That's Tony Dominguez from California. Congratulations to Tony. As always, we will be in touch about claiming your prize after the event. But for now, let's keep zipping right along and jump into our next presentation in the EcoCast. All right, up next, we are so excited to introduce Phil Schlepper, Senior Sales Engineer at Commvault. Thanks for being with us here today, Phil. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for attending today. I'm Phil Schlepper. Uh, I'm a Senior solution Specialist with Commvault Systems. Um, we're going to talk about modernizing your data protection today. Um, generally speaking, in the last couple of years, everybody is prioritizing modernization. Um, so as we've gone through the pandemic and a variety of other um, global changes, everybody is looking at digital transformation. So whether you are trying to lift and shift your workloads, whether you are worried about data preparedness and data recovery, because we are seeing new locations for all your data and or additional strategies for how do you deal with your data and your data protection and recovery. And then additionally, you know, everybody's got budget to deal with digital transformation. That doesn't necessarily mean you have budget for other parts of the, the org, but you have digital transformation dollars. Well, digital transformation covers a wide variety of functions in your IT environment. So whether those are those new specialized workloads that you're deploying, so things like Kubernetes or cloud-based applications like Microsoft Dynamics or Salesforce or new containerization, uh, but there's also additional traditional legacy specialized workloads. So your classic workloads like IBM iSeries or your Oracle CRM system or other systems like that, there are specialized ways to back all that data up and protect all that data so that you can have it from a recovery perspective. As we talk about this from a Commvault platform in conjunction with all the other vendors you're talking about today, this is about providing you a future-proof intelligent data platform. So this is the ability to manage multiple workloads across multiple platforms, whether those are your new spiffy all flash storage arrays that you're you're looking at or whether or not you're looking at your multi-cloud strategy. So yes, I have Office 365 or I have Gmail, but I also have data in AWS and I may have data in Oracle Cloud. That's a whole bunch of places for a whole bunch of data. You need to be able to bring that together in a unified experience so that you're looking at all this data in one place. The ability to get that data and deploy that from a flexible model. So do I need to deploy this as just software? Do I need it as hardware and software? Do I want to have it managed by somebody else? Um, and then pull all that together and go through that one. So from a Commvault perspective, we're talking about the industry's broadest workload coverage. So on-prem, clouds, hybrid clouds, whether they are SaaS workloads, databases, whether they're your traditional on-premise large databases or your new cloud-based databases. So things like Cosmos and Redshift, um, whether they're traditional virtual machines or whether you're in the container model. So as you move through this entire journey, you need something that can take care of that across the board, right? So I want to be able to move data from my on-prem workloads um, or from my current legacy platform on-prem to my next-gen platform on-prem, but also then bridge that into your cloud strategy. Um, same thing for secondary storage, whether you're using traditional on-prem storage with things like uh, the pure flash blades, um, or are you moving into a multi-cloud environment uh, and whether or not you want a vendor provided storage back in. So Commvault provides a, a hyperscale scale out type architecture as well. So we're going to provide you all those functions, uh, and then we're going to kind of talk about it and show you. From a demo perspective, uh, this is the Commvault UI. Um, so this is our 
what we call our command center. So this is a web-based HTML5 UI. Uh, it is role-based access control. So I'm currently logged in as a specific user, uh, but we can go through and we can do a fully role-based access control with groups and permissions and individual rights and roles in your environment because security is such a big issue and a pain point for everybody today. Because if you're not securing your data, you are going to have a problem later. So uh, from a ransomware perspective, it is no longer a, if I get attacked, it's when. So the, the escalation of all of the attack surfaces is huge in the last couple of years. You really got to lock this down. You got to make sure you minimize your attack surfaces, do all the other parts of that from an enterprise perspective. Um, so we're looking at this as a holistic view of our data. So it's not just my on-premise workloads, it's my whole virtualization workload, where in this scenario, we're actually looking at a multi-cloud environment, where we're looking at on-prem VMware and Hyper-V, and we're looking at cloud-based workloads in Azure and Amazon as we go through here. We're gonna go through and we're gonna talk a little bit about um, outcome-based management of our data as well. It is not just purely about making sure that that data is protected. It's about making sure I'm meeting service levels and I'm meeting my environment. So get yourself reporting that can go in and show you that information. What jobs are running? What jobs are successful? What jobs didn't run? What failed in the environment? How did I not meet my service level? So if I've set a service level for a four-hour RPO, what didn't meet my four-hour RPO? So the ability to go in and report on that from an outcome-based reporting is very important. Uh, as we're going through here and talking about this from a workload perspective, you have an entire variety of workloads in your environment today. You have virtualization workloads across all of your environments. So you have multiple vCenters possibly, you have multiple cloud workloads in here. So we're looking at this and you can see in this environment, we have six different hypervisors that we're protecting and that's not the end of the list from a Commvault perspective. We support eight to 10 hypervisors depending on what you're looking at here. So multiple cloud vendors, multiple on-prem hyper-converged architectures. So you can go through you can deploy what you need today. And if you migrate tomorrow, you have the ability to move guests between one hypervisor and another. So I can come in and I can pick up a VMware machine and I can move that to another cloud provider. So if we go through and pick up something that say was in my on-premise VMware environment, and I wanted to recover this, we have the ability to go through and pick this up and move it, but I can also recover it on the fly and run it from that backup architecture. But let's say we want to take this machine and lift and shift this system. I can take that and put it right back where it started from, but I can also take this and move this to an entirely another target location, provision that, build it, turn that up, and hook it into my existing environment. So let's say we wanted to take this and move this to Amazon. This is gonna let me go through, use my existing Amazon environment, browse through on the fly, dynamically look up the information based on my environment, pick it up, put it in a specific territory. It'll look up everything that's available for you in your account at that point in time including sizing of these environments. So we can go through and pick and choose what you're gonna move this to in the cloud. So this is the ability to be very, very flexible about this and be cloud native. Commvault is directly addressing the cloud at the API level. There's no gateways in between or anything else like that. So when we take data, we move data, we can protect that data on site and store it immutably in a variety of storage targets. And then we can move it into the cloud and use it straight out of that cloud object storage to read that back out, and put that back in again. So that's across multiple cloud vendors, but we still get additional bonus usage here beyond your regular native cloud 
tools. So not only can I go in and I can see when this is protected and I can go and pick up my data and use it from a specific point in time, but I can open up these guests. And that's the biggest thing. When you start looking at native tools and a lot of the cloud providers, it's just container level protection. It's not giving you the granular capabilities that a lot of us need today to surgically go in and remove or restore individual parts of your systems. Because most of us do not do huge monolithic restores of environments. Your average restores when you're not in a disaster recovery are individual files or databases or other parts of your environment as you go through here. That extends not only from a virtualization perspective, and if you notice, we're looking at a whole bunch of vendors throughout a single pane here, we're looking at containers. So the ability to go in from an application perspective at a Kubernetes cluster and grab one individual server that has data inside of it. So if we go in and grab our MySQL environment here, I can bring back a Kubernetes container as a full application and restore it to uh, the cluster it came from or another cluster. So now I have the ability to move this back and forth and we can pick this up and put this somewhere else. So to let me move it to another Kubernetes deployment out of place and the ability to put that back as well. So this allows you to bring back that persistent volume, adjust the storage, do other pieces like that as you need to. So you can actually see our, our uh, container storage interfaces here as they're available. But also bring back the persistent data inside of that volume at a granular level. Again, just like our virtual machines, this is the ability to open this up and grab individual objects from a specific point in time for our containers. That extends to your traditional file servers. So they all look the same as well. We haven't changed in these views. So it doesn't matter whether this is a traditional workload or a workload that is a legacy or a classic system or a large cluster based system. We can also go through and do object storage. So if you're protecting data or using data in one cloud environment, you can move that to another cloud. So whether that is object-based storage from an Amazon perspective, or whether we are looking at things like Azure Data Lake Gen 2. So this is very, very large data sets uh, that you wanna protect and move and granularly be able to bring that data back. So wide variety of workloads across your clouds. Same thing for databases. So you wanna be able to go in and add database servers as an actual database and protect those databases, but you also wanna be able to go in and protect those new workloads. So for example, our cloud databases, I can go in and protect across the board here for you, SQL and or um, Oracle databases in your cloud providers and the ability to move them back and forth. So not only can I go in and pull a database out of the cloud, I can help migrate an on-prem database to the cloud. So it allows you to do a lift and shift and move your data. You are not getting stuck in a single location. And that's the biggest thing about your modern data movement. We are looking to move our data now. It is not just about the actual application that I'm working on and getting stuck in a single platform. I need to exfiltrate data. There are so many cases where you've gotten into something and you've decided, you know what, this doesn't fit or I can't grow. I need to take the data from here and move it over to there because I can grow it in that platform. And this is the ability to move that data, grow that data, move it around at a granular perspective. The same thing goes for the other parts of your cloud here. So Office 365, we can go in and protect all of your Office 365 data as well. Active Directory, everybody forgets about Active Directory. This is the ability to go in and protect your actual authentication services. So go in, protect the information at a granular 
record-based level for Active Directory. Um, this is included across the board from our perspective. So reach in, protect your data, bring that data back, and use the tools that you have to protect yourself, enhance your recovery capabilities as you have users and platforms move and change. It's a dynamic work environment now as well. So you may have an employee today that leaves and comes back as a contractor or comes back as something else. And if you recreate them, that doesn't necessarily show up for everything as we go through here. Salesforce.com protection, so granular protection of Salesforce. Go through and, and utilize all of these functions. Now, when we're looking at this though, it's not just about this front side data. It's about the ability to move this data to multiple tiers of storage. So from a Commvault perspective, as we're going through here, these are your traditional backup car targets, your disk-based targets, your cloud-based targets. So these are actual direct API access to these cloud providers and the ability to add them in there as easy as possible. So whether this is a traditional storage target or one of these 75 available vendors that you would like to write to from a S3 compatible storage target. Not only are we managing and ma maintaining the data directly in that cloud vendor for you, we also offer the ability to intelligently tier this data to make sure that you're not going through and pulling back data that's either in an archive um, or in a cold tier. So something like Glacier, for example, if you were to go through and use Glacier and recall that data early, there is a very large bill for that. Commvault allows you to manage and maintain that intelligently across multiple tiers of storage. So we'll go through and we'll automatically integrate here. We still support your traditional targets. However, as we're talking about modern storage, the other part of this is scale out storage. So um, hyperscale storage, where you're actually having a multi-node large pool. Uh, so in this environment, we have three nodes that are being managed together. But we also support storage arrays. So as you get down underneath the covers, the ability to manage and maintain snapshots for multiple storage vendors. So this allows you to reach in and directly manage, for example, from the pure side of the house, directly manage your, your storage snapshots, maintain the retention as part of the backup process. So we go in, we build out that SLA, we go in and say, we need a certain number of snaps, we need a certain number of backup copies, and we would then like to retain that for a specific period of time including the ability to replicate those between storage arrays. So we'll go through, we'll build all that out, and you build out outcome-based reporting. So I can go in here and I can build out a plan that says, I want snapshots, I want tiers on-site, I want tiers off-site, and I can go through and build this entire setup out and have it automatically move data for me and intelligently tier that data within a certain period of time and maintain all that data. It will go through and run those jobs for you automatically. It will report on those jobs so we can actually go in and monitor alerts and events based on those jobs that are currently running or not running, but we'll even do anomalous looks in this environment. So we'll go in and look at a system and say, there are unusual activities here. It's supposed to be flat, except all of a sudden there are thousands of changes. That's a problem. It'll send out alerts to you to tell you that that's an issue. It does the same thing for job-based reporting. We use machine learning to go in and look for jobs. And it says this job is normally an hour to run. It's currently at two hours. And that's a problem. It'll send out an alert to you from a system in 
your own management system or something else. So if you're using an SCIM or other system, we'll go through and report that. Commvault has native reports built in as well. So there are hundreds of reports based on whatever you would like to look at. So we want to look at job status. There are all sorts of jobs and these can all be customized and scheduled based on what you're looking for. I want to know just about my SQL backups, for example. This will go through and tell us all of the jobs that were run for our specific SQL backups, when they were run, what's the backup time, when did we have it? How do I get this information when I have to go to my compliance team or my legal team and say, we did what we were supposed to do. We have this data. This is where it's at. We'll go through and report on that. So all of this is available within Commvault and it integrates with your next gen data systems and your current systems to allow you to seamlessly move that data back and forth across there. Um, we appreciate your time today. Please let us know if you have any questions. We're going to be here for the next five minutes answering questions. Okay. Well, thank you, Phil, for an awesome presentation and demo. I'm a big fan of the outcome-based reporting. Uh, and there's so many things uh, that we want to dig into with you. We already have lots of great questions coming in. Uh, just very quickly before we get started on our Q&A, you can see that poll question is back up for you all. So please do take a second and send us your feedback. Phil, again, thank you for being here with us today and for taking time to answer a few of the questions uh, coming in from our audience. Are you ready to dive in? Sure, not a problem. <laughs> Get rolling. Okay, yeah, because there's a lot of good stuff here. Um, Chris is asking about um, an API to integrate Commvault dashboard with another vendor's dashboard. Yes, yeah, so um, Commvault does have a, a full REST-based API. Um, the interface that we showed is actually REST under the covers. If you were actually to pull up the, the HTML source, you'd actually be able to see some of that information. Um, so there's actually two questions that Chris has that are going to dovetail into this one. Uh, so he asked not about not only about the API and those dashboards, but also about some reporting uh, APIs as well. Uh, those are included with the product, but they are also available to use uh, to pull data out. So you can absolutely take that data out um, from those reporting dashboards and put it into some, some other product using the same REST HTML calls that you would use um, to see them in the in the Commvault UI from that perspective. The same applies to reporting, which is you can take one of the custom reports that I talked about uh, or the existing reports and customize those and then still call that from an outside location to pull that information across. Uh, so those are available and integrated into the product and every customer gets access to those. Um, they're fully documented on our website. So there's a REST API, there's Python, um, there's a Go, there's a whole bunch of ones depending on what your, your API requirements are. Uh, and uh, there's a full API website up as well uh, for you to be able to actually uh, run backup jobs, kick off um, reporting and all the other things like that. Um, so api.commvault.com. Uh, we've already put some of the links in the chat. That's awesome. And actually, you know, while we're talking about customization, Sean was wondering about customizing the panel, um, kind of getting a little bit more about white label feel with their corporation's color scheme and branding. Can you chat a bit about that? Yeah, so um, the UI is called totally customizable, so you can change all those colors. Um, you can make them as, as muted or as garish as you would like um, <laughs> and change your, change your logo. So you can put the logo in the top corner, even the log on screen. You can uh, put a new logo in. You can uh, put up your end user license agreement, you know, remind everybody that they're not supposed to be doing bad things uh, when they <laughs> log into your systems. Um, but besides that, so Commvault is actually a multi-tenant solution. So if you brought this on site and you had multiple departments, there is actually a way for you to separate this out into, into departmental or division level um, access, and each division could have their own color scheme. So we actually support fully skinning individual, what we would call a company inside of the interface as well. Hmm, I love that. Um, so. This, we're going to, Deepak actually has a few questions here. Uh, mm -hmm. One that I, I want to jump into, um, he's asking about sort of prediction uh, versus prevention or prevention versus recovery. Um, so can this solution help uh, to prevent attacks or, or are we just talking recovery? 
So um, it's actually both, and then all of this goes together. There's an it's an entirely another conversation, uh, much more than the, <laughs> the five minutes of, of time we have here. Um, <laughs> Commvault is about both parts of that. So part of ransomware protection is the ability to find out when something is going on in your environment, and to do that, we use machine learning uh, and other role outcome based reporting to determine if something is out of the ordinary, number of changes, odd behavior on an individual system, extra long running time, things that, that actually when you're looking at this from a management perspective are out of the ordinary and could indicate that there's a problem. Uh, so that's one of the detection sides of the house. The other half of this is recovery. So it is most of a, the biggest issue with ransomware is actually the ability to bring back your data. Uh, so uh, generally everybody in the data protection business has talked about a 3 two, one So three copies of your data in two locations and at least one of them should be off-site. Um, immutability comes up. So immutability, there's a variety of ways to do immutability, whether you do it inside Commvault with worm-based copies or if you have a, a cloud-based copy, it becomes uh, an immutable type target. But there's others like, so Pure was on, the, the team at Pure has um, flash blades with some immutable features as well. So there are architectures all over the place to do the ability to protect your data and keep it stored, but also to bring that back quickly when something happens. It's no longer if, unfortunately, it's when. Um, reach out. We'll be happy to talk to you more about ransomware uh, and ways like that, Deepak, because uh, it, it's a much longer conversation than just this couple of minutes that we have here. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a big one. Um, there's actually quite a few questions coming in about uh, customization. So one, I, I, I think you've kind of addressed this, but I just want to uh, kind of make sure we call it out. Can you talk about the um, reporting and how easy it is to customize the reports that you're getting? Sure. So um, out of the box, Commvault has probably about 100 reports out of the, out of the gate. Um, we also have a Commvault store. Um, so that's available to customers. You can log in and pull down more reports that you would like. However, every one of those reports, you can go into report and there's a little button in the upper right hand corner that says edit. You can go and edit or customize those reports. So if you have some data that you wanted out of report one and data you wanted out of report two, you can go put those together into your own report, set that up and then you know set it on a schedule and have it email it to you every morning, for example. Um, but even the front dashboard when we logged in there, is customizable. You can change where those panels are. You can add panels, remove panels. So we've tried to, to give you a huge amount of flexibility as it relates to reporting and uh, gathering information because generally, ideally, you want to manage by exception. You don't want to have to be in every day looking at everything. You want to know when something's wrong uh, and have a quick view to find out when something's not going on. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, and on that note, um, I think we're just running out of time. There are so many yep. great questions here. Um, I don't know if you're going to have a little bit of time filled to, to stick around and kind of answer some on chat. Yep. Um, and certainly people, uh, you know, that folks that are sending in questions, we will follow up after the fact as well. Um, but I, I think kind of looking at, so the customization are great, and, um, but of course there's always team members involved with that. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, is this service something that makes sense for smaller businesses or is this really only enterprise only? So um, it makes sense for small businesses. Um, you know, we can do this for small environments. Uh, it's very easy to set up basic retention and basic planning. So, you know, a couple of copies of your data with just a few VMs or servers. Um, however, if you don't want that management overhead, shameless plug, we do also offer um, Commvault as a service. So that is our metallic offering. Uh, so that is backup as a service. Uh, run by Commvault uh, in the cloud, but you still get to manage and maintain it. But we take over um, the big back-end portions of that. So uh, it, it fits across the board. Um, it's not just for, for large customers. You can go down. Um, but again, you, know, you can do 10 VMs or you could do 30,000 uh, with a Commvault installation. <laughs> That's awesome. Love that. Lots of customization. Um, and it, it looks like we're, we're running low on time here. So mm -hmm. I do just want to wrap it up, uh, and it'll connect in well with kind of what you were just getting at. Can you let uh, the audience know today, if somebody is wanting to get started with Commvault, uh, you know, or get more information, what is their next step? 
Uh, the easiest way is to go to the Commvault website, www.commvault.com. There's a little bot in the corner. They'll, we have live chat people in there all the time. Uh, they'll be happy to get you in touch with whoever your local sales rep is, wherever you are in the world. So uh, that team it will be happy to, to get you in touch with somebody, and they will talk to you and figure out what the best fit is, and, and we want to do what's right for you. So. That's awesome. Well, a big thank you again, Phil, for uh, being here to chat with us and, uh, and answering on the live chat as well. We really appreciate no it. No problem. All right. And uh, to everyone else who filled out the poll or asked a question today, thank you to you as well. If you haven't already, you can download the Commvault Solutions Brief in the Handout tab uh, and read a bit more about the modernizing data protection. So uh, go check that out. All right. And we'll move forward here. Oh, would you look at that? It's time for another prize drawing here in the uh, EcoCast event. So the winner of another $500 Amazon gift card is Harvey Yazujan. Yazujian? I'm going to spell that. Y-A-Z-I-J-I-A-N. Harvey Yazujan from Massachusetts. I'm sure I said that wrong, Harvey. My apologies. But as, a, as an apology for that, we'll give you a $500 uh, Amazon gift card. Congratulations to you, and we will be in touch about claiming your prize after the event. But for now, we have already come to our last session of the day, and don't worry, we are ending with a bang. We'll head into our final session in today's EcoCast. We'll be hearing from Amit Rolani, Director of Technology Alliances from Cloudian, and Adam Berg, Solution Architect for Cloud Native Technical Partnership at Casten. I can't wait to hear from these guys. So Amit, Adam, I will hand the mic over to you. To our webcast, uh, uh, talking about enterprise-grade Kubernetes protection with Cloudian and Casten. Today with me, I have Adam Berg, uh, Solution Architect for Cloud Native Technical Partnerships at Kasten, and I am uh, Amit Savlani, De Director of Technology Alliances at Cloudian. Uh, together, we're going to walk you guys through uh, our, uh, our joint uh, integration around data protection for Kubernetes-based workloads. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Adam to begin the presentation. Thanks, Amit. So welcome everybody, and um, I'm really happy that you're all spending some time with us today. And I want to take everyone through uh, a bit of a, a journey uh, here with with Kubernetes, uh, if you if you don't mind. Uh, you know, Kubernetes is is really topical right now, and it's sort of taking off like a rocket ship. So let's take you through a little bit of a journey of where we've gone as an industry and where we're going. You know, if, if you've been around uh, quite a bit, uh, like me and Amit, you know, we, you know, I was actually working in, in the IT industry, you know, back when the data center cons consisted of primarily just mainframes, right? Large, singular servers running a single operating system, running a single application. And, and that was largely, you know, that's what our data centers look like. And uh, a fundamental revolution happened and we had a front row seat to this, which was really exciting. And it was really the, the advent of something called the hypervisor. And the hypervisor really, you know, although it wasn't invented by VMware, they, they, they brought it to the masses. The, the hypervisor, and especially VMware in particular, allowed us to consolidate all of these workloads onto a single piece of hardware. We're able to run multiple operating systems, multiple Linux operating systems, multiple Windows operating systems on top of a singular infrastructure. And this revolutionized our data center. It really uh, provided uh, workloads to start scaling and start being managed. And uh, that's really where vSphere became really popularized because they brought a solution where really solved this problem of VMware sprawl. We had this, this uh, or VM sprawl. We had this, uh, you know, we started having hundreds of virtual machines and thousands of virtual machines, and we needed to, uh, really a way to manage them. And if we needed to clone an application, I had to clone an entire operating system. And if I, you know, if I needed, uh, you know, dozens or even hundreds of web servers, I had to clone an entire web server. And this is, you know, this is fundamentally a challenge today in, in today's data center, especially around security. We've got, uh, you know, every time I, I, I clone a, uh, an application, I have to clone an entire uh, operating system. And I have to worry about things like security. I have to worry about things uh, like patching. And, um, you know, fundamentally, these applications are very heavy. Uh, and, you know, I think there's a fundamental shift now to say, you know, why do I need to clone an entire operating system if I'm really just interested in the application itself? So we've started to shift, you know, fundamentally to this idea of 
containerizing the application. So if you if you heard about containers, that's really fundamentally what we're talking about is separating the application away from the operating system. And when I need to distribute an application, clone an application, scale an application, it's just the application, not the entire operating system. And we get a, a much lighter weight scaling uh, in our uh, in our data center. Uh, you know, we, we see Docker here on the screen. Docker didn't invent the container, but again, like VMware, they they brought containers to the masses. They popularized this idea of taking an application, separating it away from the operating system, and uh, and, and and changing the way that we distributed these applications. Again, we have the same. <clears throat> excuse me. Again, we have the same problem that we had in the v, you know in the VM days of of. Uh, now we've got container sprawl. We need a way to manage hundreds or even thousands of containers that are being deployed and scaled throughout our, uh, our throughout our data centers now. And uh, you know, there's been some uh, some players that have stepped in to try to be that de facto orchestration engine for containerized applications. And that really now it seems more than ever that Kubernetes is the winner in the space. So I think you're going to be hearing about uh, Kubernetes is now the de facto scaling engine uh, and orchestration engine for containerized workloads. Uh, Kubernetes, of course, came out of the Google Labs. They were uh, uh, initially a Google project. They open sourced uh, they open sourced this project, gave it to the community. It's now being run and managed by the CNCF. That's the Cloud Native Computing Foundation who manages this open source project. And I think this is really why uh, Kubernetes has become the de facto orchestration tool, because it is being managed as, a, as an open source project. And uh, it you know, it's really is pulling ahead. What are the analysts saying here about containers? I mean, this thing is going to be massive. They're saying 500 million new apps are going to be deployed as containerized applications by 2024. 75% of enterprises are, are stating that they're going to be running containerized applications uh, by 2025. But I think what's most surprising to us is that most organizations, uh, you know, uh, only 52% really are, are realizing that existing data protection tools are, are not adequate in this new space. Uh, you know, the, the, what we call legacy or, or data protection tools designed for uh, physical workloads, traditional virtualized workloads, or even uh, you know, uh, operating system um, workloads up in the public cloud. Um, you know, organizations are slowly starting to realize that they need new tools, that this ecosystem is different and it's changing and requires new tools uh, for, uh, for day two operations in Kubernetes. But, you know, the real here, you know, the real takeaway is that the, the threat of ransomware is not going away, even in this new space. Uh, it, the, you know, I've ripped a few headlines here uh, just recently about, uh, about Kubernetes. I think um, there's a uh, possibly an incorrect feeling out in um, uh, out in most organizations that uh, you know Kubernetes is a safer environment to run applications. Uh, that there's uh, uh, you know that there aren't malware, there isn't ransomware, that there are less security flaws in containerized applications. You know it certainly uh, isn't true. Uh, I think that there's more meaty targets <laughs> to still today in traditional workloads. But as we see the shift into Kubernetes, you're going to see more you know ransomware malware um, organizations that are really out there you know attacking you know they're using this as a business model right fundamentally uh, uh, it's a money making venture for most uh, ransomware makers they're going to start attacking software kubernetes targets as as more primary data moves into uh, into the kubernetes ecosystem so what are some of the top challenges that we're seeing out there we we have a front row seat here uh, at cast and by veeam of of seeing all the challenges from a data security and data protection standpoint in Kubernetes. Um, number one, you know, these aren't unique to Kubernetes, misconfiguration. Uh, lack of least privileged separation is number one. I think there's this, you know, it, this is a new environment, new ecosystem. There's still a skills gap that we're seeing out there for a lot of organizations. Um, so there's still you know, just general misconfigurations that are allowing, um, you know, bad actors in, in, in the back door of their environments. Uh, lack of visibility is a is a huge uh, problem right now in uh, in these environments. Uh, understanding how the different containers talk to each other, um, how do uh, applications even function from a security standpoint inside of uh, of Kubernetes? Lack that visibility into uh, the environment is causing um, a lot of soft targets right now uh, in in the, in the containerized world. And then advanced persistent threats. This is your, your typical typical zero days, data security, uh, data application flaws, data security flaws. 
Zero days exist uh, in open source applications and open source projects. There are security flaws out there that you need to be protecting yourself from. So data protection, disaster recovery, ransomware protection is fundamentally important to getting uh, over the hump in from, uh, you know, from day one pre-production environments up into day two uh, production ready environments. You're going to need data protection solutions uh, that, are, uh, that are fundamentally designed for these new environments and understand these new environments. Let's talk about Kasten and Cloudian uh, for Kubernetes data protection. This is a really a great match uh, for protecting uh, your data. Uh, so again, Kasten's uh, mission statement here is really about backup and recovery, application mobility, and disaster recovery, enabling day two operations. Again, day two is really where uh, we're seeing a, a lot of the adoption slow for Kubernetes. We're seeing a lot of pre-production environments that can't seem to get over that hump because they can't guarantee the availability of their data. And that's really why a partnership between uh, Kasten and Clouding can really get your organization to that day two step. So what are we, uh, what are we providing? Uh, we're the number one Kubernetes data protection tool in this space. Kasten uh, by Veeam has been around for nearly six years. So we're the most mature, uh, most feature capable product in the space. Uh, we're built for Kubernetes, meaning we're, we reside within your Kubernetes cluster and integrate with all the native API and tooling. Uh, out of the box end-to-end -end security is fundamental uh, to, to the product, not only uh, supporting role-based access controls and multitudes of different authentication mechanisms, but end-to-end -end encryption uh, enabled by default. And we support things like object lock technology with Cloudian to secure your data uh, from ransomware, insider threats, hackers, and, and even accidental deletion. Uh, having that rich ecosystem, having the, the ability to support multiple different kinds of Kubernetes distributions, having that rich ecosystem, the application support, all the way down to that hardware and infrastructure layer, CAS and K10 has the broadest ecosystem of support in the industry. And then we make it all easy, right? So we're going to show you a demo of how easy it is to use Cloudian and Kasten to, secure, to properly secure your Kubernetes environment, uh, completely easy and simple uh, in a really intuitive way. So what does this look like from an architecture standpoint? So we, inside your Kubernetes cluster, applications are, are, again, they're complex entities inside of a Kubernetes cluster. You get your ingress uh, configurations, uh, your service secret configurations, your pods, your config maps, your service accounts, your persistent volume plans, all of those are really what make up an application. Uh, CAS and K10 protects the application as a whole. We do data du deduplication, compression, and encryption on that data, and we send it off to Cloudian, where in Cloudian Hyperstore with object lock, your data is completely secure. It's immutable. Uh, it cannot be modified, deleted, and removed. So let's hear more about Cloudian from Amit. Thank you. That was that was amazing, Adam. Uh, you you covered uh, so many so much ground in so little time. I'm amazed. Uh, so so folks, we're we're going to quickly uh, and briefly talk about Cloudian. For those of you who haven't uh, you know worked with us before, Cloudian is a software defined storage specifically designed for the hybrid cloud. Right. The, our focus is on security. We have military grade security, limitless scalability, and seamless cloud integration. This is cloud native at its core, right? We let you optimize data access, meet your data sovereignty needs, and cut costs by consolidating information in a single cloud-like platform, right? Some of the key benefits uh, as we talk about Cloudian are uh, you're able to consolidate any kind and all kinds of data at scale on one platform. This includes servers, VMs, containers, we have deployment options in all of these methodologies. And, you know, this is the, your, your actual evolution of your storage system coming in, uh, meeting you with, with whatever needs you have, right? Uh, we provide the industry's highest level of security and ransomware protection, something that Adam uh, touched on, and we'll, we'll get into that a little more. So coming to our integration with Kasten, so K10 and Cloudian specifically are a perfect match to protect your modern application infrastructure and your applications and your data needs, right? Um, what this actually means for you is the capability of uh, doing a backup and recovery for modern applications specifically. Now, as you guys might know, object storage is the storage for cloud native applications. This is the storage of the cloud. That's where it was, uh, that's where it started. What we're doing is 
bringing it in a hybrid context. S3 is the de facto standard of cloud storage, and Cloudian and Kasten seamlessly integrate using S3 APIs. Uh, Kasten K10 fully supports S3, uh, S3 and object storage as uh, a target for the backup, and Cloudian offers exactly that, right? Now, Cloudian and Kasten support object lock, which is a way of implementing uh, Worm in cloud storage systems, right? And when object lock is enabled, uh, on the uh, starting from the backup workload, uh, the application and data backup are made immutable, which is nothing but they're completely tamper-proof for the duration specified by the user during the creation of the workload. Even if a hacker is able to penetrate your uh, perimeter defense system, they will not be able to carry out any of the cryptographic uh, ransomware attack and your data is recoverable. In addition, Cloudian actually offers uh, root lockout or root disable when shipped in worm mode, which means that even if the hacker is able to get privileged access, getting into uh, you know administrator mode, they will not be able to decrypt or they will not be able to delete your data, sorry, encrypt or be able to delete your data, which is what uh, a ransomware attack is. So it's a complete lockout of uh, ransomware as uh, you may know it. Okay. I'm going to leave you with uh, a quick summary of the highlights. So data immutability with Cloudian and uh, Kasten is, is key to you know, securing your data. This is enhanced by all the security certifications we have at uh, the Cloudian level, which really is government level security. right? Um, for data at rest, we support data encryption so that even if you know it's, it's somebody that's trying to get into your system and leak your data, they cannot uh, if implemented properly. And of course, to be able to do secure multi-tenancy in large organizations, that's the holy grail of all of this. So uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Adam for uh, running us through the demonstration. All right, let's let's get into the demo. Let's see how this all works. So uh, enjoy. This is a, a demo of Cloudian and Kasten enterprise grade Kubernetes protection, uh, you know, for everyone. Let's let's get right into it. And welcome to this demo of enterprise grade Kubernetes protection with Kasten K10 and Cloudian. In this demo, we'll log into Cloudian to create a new bucket for use with Kasten K10 by V. It's as easy as entering a new bucket name and enabling object lock. Object Lock will allow us to create immutable object repositories for Kubernetes data protection. Clicking Create and OK will create our bucket for use with Kasten K10 by Veeam. We just need to set a few options before we're ready to enable this bucket for Kasten. Click Properties, review some of your settings, and go to the Object Lock section of the Properties. Here we want to enable compliance mode and a default retention period and click save. We're now ready for our setup of Kasten K10 by Veeam. Let's jump over to our Kasten K10 user interface. Here's the default interface for Kasten K10 by Veeam. When initially logging in, we'll enter our email address and our company name. Here in the Kasten K10 interface, you'll notice a few main cards, application, policies, usage, and reports. But the first thing we want to set up is our connection to the Cloudian object storage. Click Settings and Location Profiles. Location profiles are used as the target destination for data protection. Set your profile name, select S3 compatible, and enter your access key, secrets, endpoints, region, and bucket name. Select Enable Immutable Backups to enable object lock compatibility with Cloudian. Click Validate Bucket to check that everything's ready to go. And click Save Profile. We're now set up to create our first Kubernetes backup. Let's first install an application here that we can use to test our data protection with Cloudian. In this demo, we'll install a simple WordPress application. This WordPress application will create 
multiple pods and multiple persistent volume claims that we can protect. Let's check our WordPress installation here. As you can see, it automatically is discovered by casting K10 by Veeam. Clicking details will show you all the details about the application, including its PVCs, its workload pods, and all the metadata and configuration options for the pod. Let's create some unique data inside our WordPress application so we can validate that our data protection is working. Let's create a, a quick post that will create some data in the database for WordPress. Okay, now that we have some unique data in here, let's create a data protection policy. Here in Casting K10 by Veeam, it's as simple as creating a new policy, setting the snapshot frequency, and then setting the export policy frequency out to our Cloudian Object Lock enabled bucket. Select our application, review the options, and click Create Policy. Our policy is now ready to run. Let's click Run Once to run this policy now. We can see the policy run action back in our dashboard. Clicking Activity will allow us to see the details of our currently running data protection job. As you can see, our data protection policy is now running, and in just a few seconds, we'll have our snapshot and our export out to our Cloudian Object Lock Enabled Bucket. If we go back to our dashboard and click Applications, we can now see that our WordPress application is compliant with our data protection policy. Now let's check the power of Cloudian Object Lock Enabled Technology. I'm logged in with Super User Access. And if I want to try to delete this bucket, we can see that the bucket is not able to be deleted normally because there's files here. If we try to manually delete the files, we'll also get an error that the action is unable to be performed, so access is denied. Even with super user access, the data cannot be removed, thus protecting against ransomware and insider threats. So let's go back to our Casting K10 interface and let's delete our WordPress application completely from our Kubernetes cluster. We'll do this so that we can test our recovery procedure to validate that we're able to completely recover the application. So off screen, I'll delete the application completely and the namespace. We should see the application disappear from the cast and K10 interface when the delete is complete. And our application has been deleted. To recover the application, Inside of Cast and K10, we can choose Filter by Status to see our removed applications. Our WordPress application now shows up as a deleted application. We can choose our Cloudian recovery point to recover this application back to a namespace. Let's recreate the namespace, review the options, and click Restore. This will restore the entire application back to the original WordPress namespace from our Cloudian Object Lock enabled bucket. Just a few seconds, we should be able to watch the recovery complete in the action details window. As you can see, the WordPress application is now recovered and compliant with policies. Let's log back into our WordPress application and validate that our unique data is there, and it is. Our Cloudian plus Kasten post is back. And that's it for our demo of enterprise grade Kubernetes data protection with Casting K10 and Cloudian. So I hope you all enjoyed that demo. I do want to leave you with one last uh, you know, parting gift here. So we're giving back to the community here at, at Cast. We're all about educating around Kubernetes and helping give back to this new and, and growing ecosystem. Learning.casten.io is free. Kubernetes uh, training right in your browser uh, with real Kubernetes clusters. This is not uh, YouTube videos or, or, or PowerPoints or PDFs. This is real interactive live Kubernetes clusters training. You get certifications, you get badges. There's leaderboards out there for uh, your Kubernetes training. So go out there and check out uh, learning.casten.io for your learning journey into this new and amazing space that we're calling containers and Kubernetes. And again, Kasten, try for free. We're giving away free Kasten K10. Uh, you can try it for free at kasten.io slash try dash Kasten dash K10. We're giving away 10 free nodes. That's 10 completely free nodes of 
casting K10 uh, for your Kubernetes cluster to try. It's fully uh, 100% usable forever. Uh, uh, try today uh, free casting K10. And then I wanted to give you guys a chance to uh, explore Cloudian. And uh, here's some ways to stay in, in touch with Cloudian. We do have uh, free trials, uh, which is cloudian.com slash free trial. So please go there, explore. Uh, you can also look at our joint solution with Kasten on cloudian.com forward slash Kasten. And we look forward to engaging with you guys uh, in, the, in the near future. And with that, let's take Thank some Q&A. Thanks a bit. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I knew I was going to do that at some point, leaving my microphone on. Uh, that was such an interesting presentation and demo. Um, I'm so happy that you're both able to stick around and answer some questions for our audience. Uh, we have lots of interesting questions coming in already. Um, before we do jump in, I just want to point out one more time that we have the poll question up. So please do take a minute uh, and, and give us some feedback on what else you would like to hear from Cloudy and Kasten. And then Adam, again, thank you for being with us. What an awesome presentation. Thank you. We, uh, we really appreciate your time and everyone's time uh, who's joined today. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we, we actually got some feedback from the audience saying how much they enjoyed it. Uh, we heard from Dan, who says he really likes your user interface. So uh, you're, you guys have some raving fans out there. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, you guys ready to jump into some questions? Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, one here, actually, this, this is an interesting one. Um, Marvin was kind of wondering about um, uh, other cybersecurity vendors and, and, uh, and traditional security vendors. You know, could you talk a little bit about um, what your uniques are, what, what's going to make you guys stand out? Yeah, this is a great question and, and one we hear a, a lot, right? So Kubernetes is a, is a hot space. You're going to see a lot of traditional data protection vendors start to uh, move into the Kubernetes data protection space. Um, and what, um, what you need to know about Kasten is that Kasten is the most mature product in this space. Uh, we've been around for nearly six years, believe it or not, doing nothing but in, uh, with, you know, with laser focus on data protection strictly for containers running inside of Kubernetes. Uh, we're Kubernetes native, meaning that we, uh, we run within, within the Kubernetes cluster. We integrate with native Kubernetes APIs. We're not a bolt-on or an add-on product. Uh, what you're seeing is um, a lot of uh, traditional vendors um, integrating third-party open source tooling, um, you know, bolting that onto their product and saying that they have a Kubernetes data protection solution. So um, you know, what you need to know is look at the maturity of the products, look at the capabilities and the feature sets. Kasten, uh, as well as Cloudian, are the market leaders in this space. Uh, and don't take our word for it, there are industry analysts. Uh, specifically, uh, there's a GigaOM report that just came out uh, for uh, rating or looking at the players in the Kubernetes space, and they've rated Kasten the number one player in the Kubernetes data management and data protection space. Awesome. Um, actually, can we – we do have a question. Oh, sorry, Emmett, did you want to chime in on that? I, I did want to add on to what yeah. uh, Adam just said, and, you know, Adam is absolutely right. Uh, this is – you know, the, the premier solution for uh, cloud native data protection. Uh, but as I heard the question, uh, I did want to clarify something for the, for the speaker as well that, you know, as, as cybersecurity solutions go, you still talk about, most, most of the people talk about, you know, perimeter defense solutions. What Kasten provides is protection for your backups and that's where ransomware attackers these days are mostly focused on. They know that that's their last line of defense. And Kasten and Cloudian together give you the, uh, the perfect solution to make your, your Kubernetes environment, your, your whole modern application environment tamper-proof. And that becomes your last line of defense because we know the best perimeter security defenses can also get penetrated. It, all it needs is one loose chink in the chain and you have the hacker inside your systems. Well, with Kasten mm -hmm. and Cloudian, now you're always going to be able to recover uh, your data and not have to worry about you know ransomware, ransomware attacking you because this is your 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 best defense and it is your final line of defense. Hmm. Okay. 
Um, can Claudine and Kasten help me to air gap my Kubernetes data? This is coming from Paul, and a few other people have been wondering about this as well. Yeah, um, you want to take I that can, one? I, yeah, I, I can. And uh, I was actually starting to type that answer. Uh, Claudian and Kubernetes both can run on-prem. We are uh, we, we, we are a software-defined uh, solution, and uh, we, we run within your data center inside your secure networks and you know from an air gap perspective uh, as long as you have uh, uh, Kasten connected to your applications uh, within your data center and having uh, Cloudian on-prem in your data center behind your firewalls it can be a completely isolated location uh, from that perspective right and we can make your entire uh, solution beyond that also uh, immutable so you have extra layer of protection on that. Awesome. Um, you know, this was a great question, and I think this is important to think about uh, with a lot of these things here is, is sort of the effect of actually rolling it out. You know, it's great in theory, but, you know, getting it to your team. So Chris is wondering about uh, training that might be available um, to help uh, the team learn how to navigate around the dashboard and, and all the various features so that they can get the most out of, out of your product. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll comment from a casting perspective. So, uh, we have, uh, you know, we're, we're really big on education at Kasten and giving back to the community. We actually provide 100% free Kubernetes uh, training at learning.kasten.io. You can get free Kubernetes training there with real Kubernetes clusters. Um, you can achieve badges and certifications there. Uh, not only uh, will you learn about data protection and day two operations uh, with Kasten, but you'll learn um, how to deploy a Kubernetes cluster, how to deploy your first apps, how to, um, you'll learn about persistent storage and, and CSI drivers uh, for managing uh, storage-based snapshots in Kubernetes, all from learning.casten.io. So it uh, can be a one-stop, uh, complete um, education journey uh, for, you know, for people that are just starting out in this space. Um, as we know, this is an emerging space and uh, everyone, uh, everyone needs uh, learning and you can't be free. So learn, that's learning.casten.io. I will, I will attest to that. I've taken courses over there. Excellent, excellent resource. Uh, love, uh, you know, the, the training material you guys have over there. Um, and um, adding on to that, from a Cloudian perspective, you do have, uh, we do have a, a proper training department and, uh, you know, we do offer a, a completely white glove treatment to get you guys up to speed with your solutions for uh, modern data management. That's awesome. Um, and actually, on, on the note of sort of free resources, um, there are free and open source backup solutions uh, and ob object storage in, in the Kubernetes space. Now, I know we talked a little bit about some of the uniques, but um, Adam, I'm wondering from the Kasten perspective if you can talk about why should enterprises go with commercial products at all? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a common question, right? We're we're playing in a an open source ecosystem. I mean, fun, you know, fundamentally, cloud native means a lot of open source technologies. Uh, and the you know, the question is, why should I go with a commercial product when there's open source alternatives? Um, you know, quite frankly, you get what you pay for. Um, and with a commercial product, you have an entire team standing behind you. Uh, data protection is probably not something that you want to um, rely on community support. Uh, when you're talking about your most critical resource, and you get a, a maturity uh, of a commercial product. Uh, there's, there's, there isn't an open source product that has the feature set and capabilities that Kasten has uh, in, the, in the day two uh, Kubernetes management space. So you're getting capabilities that aren't available in, uh, in, in, in an open source alternative. Uh, but we, you know, we also have a free version of our product though. So um, out of the box, you get 10 free nodes um, right out of the box without having to contact uh, Kasten. Uh, and you can use us uh, with community-based support uh, without having to pay a dime for Kasten. So if you're 10 nodes and less, or you want to just try out uh, um, Kasten in your uh, clusters today, just go ahead and install us with a simple Helm chart. Um, you can see the instructions at docs.kasten.io to, uh, uh, to install our product. Really simple. Love that. Um, and I think uh, we're going to got a lot of questions coming in, so uh, we will get back to some of those, I think, after the presentation here. Um, so we're, we're just kind of wrapping up here. But I have two last questions. One is for Amit uh, and Claudian. Uh, how does the solution protect against the threat of data exfiltration attacks? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> what, we're going to end on a big one. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, you know you could you could actually write volumes on that but um, the, i see where the question is coming from the demonstration we had was about ransomware protection which is typically a cryptographic attack uh, and you know locking up the data does still keep the data uh, readable so uh, as we've seen exfiltration attacks are all about taking the data private data and making it public and holding you ran, uh, holding the ransom to you know not wanting you to get customer data exposed uh, well to that effect uh, adam mentioned that uh, you know caston is is a completely secure uh, application it starts from there you you talk about you know uh, encryption of data in motion and once it lands in cloudian you know we support uh, you know, the 256 bit encryption, which is military grade encryption. And we have a host of um, security features built into the product uh, that implemented correctly, when implemented correctly, will make your your uh, data residing in Cloudian and the, in the Cloudian cast and solution uh, completely, you know, secure from a perspective of exfiltration attack. So even if customers, uh, sorry, hackers get into the system, one, they won't be able to modify that. So that's, uh, it, that's, that stops the cryptographic attack. And if they can read it, unless they have the encryption, decryption keys, you know, uh, they cannot uh, read it or expose that data. So that's, that's the other way uh, that you can protect your data with this solution. Awesome. Um, I, we are running a bit short on time here, so we will have to wrap it up. But I, I just want to ask you guys before you go, um, if somebody wants to get started with Claudine and Casson and find out more, you know, what do you recommend? What are the next steps? And, and while you're kind of going through that, if you could just reiterate, there were some amazing free offerings that you guys have brought up and, and mentioned at the end of your presentation. Um, and if you could just reiterate that one more time, because I, I think those are pretty incredible offerings. We want to make sure everyone is aware of them. Yeah, real quick for Kasten, visit Kasten.io. We've got the instructions there to try Kasten completely free. Uh, it's completely free for 30, uh, for unlimited notes for 30 days and then 10 notes free forever. Uh, and you can also visit learning.kasten.io to try out Kasten directly in your browser on real live Kubernetes clusters and get uh, free training and free uh, certifications around uh, Kubernetes related topics as well. And then from a Cloudian side, you can visit cloudian.com slash free trial. We do offer up to uh, 90 days of uh, uh, free trial for our customers and prospects. And, you know, we will definitely work with you guys to get you comfortable before uh, there is a, any need to actually uh, get commercial with uh, the product. So uh, do visit cloudian.com and there's a boatload of resources that you can actually uh, avail of right away. Great. Well, I love that. And, and thank you again to both of you for, for joining us and for spending so much time uh, chatting and, and answering questions. Thank you. This is great. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. And uh, thank you to our audience for asking some great questions. I can see that there's still some coming in. Uh, so Adam and Emmett will be responding as much as possible in live chat and then following up after the event. Um, and Thank you to everyone who responded to our poll question here. Love seeing those results come back in. And that means that it's time for our very last prize drawing. So the final winner of the $500 Amazon gift card is Jason Powell of Tennessee. Jason Powell of Tennessee. Congratulations to Jason. We will be in touch about claiming your prize after the event, and we will follow up with the best question prize winner. Remember that was from each section after the event as well. All right, so if you are here on the event today and you would like to chat with us about presenting at a future EcoCast or Megacast event, we want to hear from you. So reach out via email at connect at actualtechmedia.com. That's connect at actualtechmedia.com. Shoot us a message and let's uh, get some awesome content rolling together. And before you head out today, make sure you check out the Actual Tech Media Ransomware Guide in the Handouts tab. You can find everything you need to know about ransomware, how to understand, prevent, and recover. Uh, this is a clickable link right down at the bottom of the screen there, and so make sure you do visit ransomware.org for more information. 
And with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, David and I want to thank all of our speakers from Pure Storage, Convault, and Clouding with Kasten for making this event possible. I hope that you have all learned something interesting, some helpful tips today about modern storage solutions. I know I've learned a ton. And I have loved chatting with our fascinating speakers and with all of you here today. So a very special thank you to everyone for attending and, and again, asking some really great questions. Don't forget to check out, check out the actual tech media event portal for some great upcoming events. And hey, come join us here for our next megacast, protecting SaaS application security and data protection consideration. That's coming up this Thursday, that's Thursday, April 7th at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Pacific. That's 10, 10, or sorry, 9 a.m. Pacific and 10 a.m. Mountain Standard. I'm going to do that one more time so no one gets confused. 12 a.m. 12 p.m. Eastern. 9 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Mountain Standard. We hope to see you all there, and until then, you have a great rest of your day.